Right, I'm delighted to say we're talking with Bernard Brogan about his new book. It's called The Hill and it's in all good bookshops now. It's really good. And it's the first opportunity we've ever had to see inside the Dublin dressing room from the, the Jim Gavin era. So <laughs> that must have been a big enough decision for you to go. I'm going to tell the truth about what happened and reveal what goes on. Well, uh, what I wanted to do was tell my, my journey along and my challenges and also highlight some of the amazing individuals um, that, that made my journey so amazing. Um, I obviously was wanted to be respectful of the dressing room. That team is, is still um, in pursuit of, of a six, six in a row and still in pursuit of all Ireland's and a lot of them will be around for, for, for years to come. So I didn't want to give away any, anything too too major, but I felt it was it was I could I could especially with Jim moving away and it been a total new dressing room, new management. Did that really help? Actually, absolutely, yeah. Um, like I, I know nothing what's happening in the dressing room now. I don't ask any questions on purpose because obviously I have that was right in the book. But, but like one of the final scenes is is you sitting down with Jim to tell him you're retiring, and then and you've no clue at that stage. You're mm. kind of talking to him about what next year is going to be like, and he's. It sounds like he hadn't quite made up his mind at that point. Six weeks later, he announces, and you're like, "Whew! I can write everything now." <laughs> Yeah, not that it, um, yeah, you, you, you want to be respectful. Um, and that group was successful because of um, its unity and it's kept itself to itself. And how much, much did that mean to the success? Who knows? Um, there's a lot of different variables that, that drive success. But um, I wanted to, be, wanted to be respectful of that. But I think um, when you do something special like that, um, and obviously I was, I was heavily invested in that, and I... Um, I felt like I felt like there was a story there to be told, you know. Oh, um, there are, like, and, and there's a million different stories to be told. Each yeah. of the individuals who are there. Everyone has their own story, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and my one is about challenges. It, it, it's an angle into the dressing room, uh, um, from my point of view. Um, that's probably different to a lot of people's because I, in the last, especially the last couple of years, I only played five minutes twice. You know what I mean? So I, I, it's it's not the same mindset or the same environment that maybe a. A young lad had like a Conor Callaghan would have, or Kieran Kenny or Brian Fenton that are driving the energy. You know, so mine is mine is a different different mindset and a different view, but a view. Yeah, totally. And and I look, it, 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 that's why we started with the the Kerry stuff previously was because, and uh, that's the the um, stone on which the sword gets sharpened. It's these mm. defeats where one you think you're really close to them, and it's like, oh look, we're really close, and then they just a buzzsaw, and they they cut you off the next time, and all of a sudden you've got to go back to the, the drawing board. Um, I, you said something there about the, our success is a lot of variables. Sport is so random. Mm. There's a there's a game where Mayo scored two on goals in an All Ireland final and ends in a draw. Like you know, when you think back on all the stuff that you did that year as a team and as a group and all the meetings and the people who came and spoke to you and the mindfulness and all that stuff, mm. like it's so random. Absolutely, yeah, and that sh says it all. You say it there. And sometimes for that success, you need luck, and you need you, like Mark talked about when we got over the line in 2011, we were a different team coming into it and we were different. If Kerry had won that, we'd be looking back and saying, God, we weren't good enough, we, weren't, we hadn't done this, we hadn't done that. Like, it's easy to, to applaud the, the efforts of, of a team that's successful, but um, yes, you, you, you have to put yourself in the position and have to be prepared to get over the line. But along that journey, there's a lot of different variables. Once you cross the white line, um, as, Jim, as Jim said, let me see if I can get this right, is the all... all Preparation for war. I won't get this right, but basically, the, when you cross the white line, all your preparation of war goes out the window because you, once you meet the, meet the enemy, um, it's all up in the air. And yeah. that's, what, that's whatever happens, whatever way the ball no falls. No plan survives the first sortie against the enemy. Yes. Is that it? Yes. That's and, the first it, more eloquently said. <laughs> Jim it's, won't be happy now with that, that effort. But. Um, the prodigal son makes a, uh, an appearance here at, at just the precise right moment as well. So, um, uh, for for people who are kind of unfamiliar with the, the details, you do your cruise ship in February of 2017, 2018, 2018. So, um, and get back just for the end of that championship, and decide to come back for 2019. And uh, you're having very robust conversations with Jim Gavin towards the end of the the season. At various stages, these conversations feel like this could be the end. It's like mm. there's this kind of which ratchets up the tension a good bit, but the prodigal son making an appearance here, I, I actually love the parable because it doesn't make any sense to me, right? When you think about the prodigal son is, you can go off and have the have all the crack, do whatever it is, spend all the family's money, you go, you go and play football in Boston if you want to, and then you come back and there's a party for you in the fatted calf. It's always the people who are left at home. But how does this parable make you, what is, it makes me want to party when I hear that parable, <laughs> right? That's why I, that's... Uh, what did it mean for me? Well, no, I think like you were right to be pissed off, weren't you? Yeah, well, like uh, here, I, I, as you said, I was 
fighting with my fingernails to get back uh, into that team in 2018. Did my cruise shoot, came back in record time. I think I was back on the pitch um, within four months, four and a half months. I came on against what's common um, for a couple of minutes, but through a blood sub, um, I just about got on. Um, after five, five and a half, five and a bit months, you know, um, and then didn't see any more action for the rest of the year, I decided to come back and asked that if I come back. I know I'm probably going to pick an order. This team is an amazing team, but I want the opportunity to to play if I'm if I'm if I get myself to the level that I need to be. And through, throughout the year, I wasn't really getting there. And um, and yeah, I suppose why I was why I was annoyed is that like I was working hard. I was there. I hadn't gotten a chance. hadn't proved this. hadn't proved right or wrong. My theory or Jim's theory about. Um, I say in the book, the Kerry game in 2000 and um, it was until 2017 um, when I said that four balls went over my head and it was like Jim just decided I'm no longer a starter anymore for this team. I'm just too old or I'm just... That's the league final? Yeah, league final, yeah. 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 Which genuinely, <laughs> the balls were kicked over my head, you know what I mean? I didn't play well, but that, it, it, was, it, was, it wasn't all my fault. Um, so I was trying to come back. I said to Jim at the start of the year, and Jason and all the management team. I want to be a 15-minute man. I know I'm not going to start for you. I don't have 60, 70 minutes in the belt, in the tank. I'm going to get, get, I'm going to hone my kick, and then I'm going to be. If I get two shots, I'm going to score two of them. If I get one shot, I'll, I'll put the ball over the bar. I was building myself for a certain situation, and I just felt. Like, what did they say to that? They were like, "Yeah, I like that." I said, "Like, you know, you're going to come up against something. We're going to come up against the team. We're not going to have it all our own way." 2018 kind of got over the line relatively easy. You know what I mean? There was no major stress around it. 2019, I says, this is not going to just fall in, your, fall in your lap. I says, you're going to need um, some, some left to centre, some solutions. So that's what I'm hoping to be for you. Um, and that was all positive and off I went. And then just as the year went on, I just felt I wasn't getting, and I was getting frustrated, and then you're not playing well in training. And you didn't see any much league time in 2019? I saw five minutes against Cavan. I got blocked and just was... Like, just I came into the game frustrated. I come on to the, I came into the game positive because I, I was told it was going to get game time. Got five minutes frustrated on the bench before I came on. Then got nod to nod, warmed up frustrated, got on. Yeah, and, and uh, you get blocked and you end up frustrated. So I was literally at the end of the league, I was more or less throwing the hat at it. Um, but I got um, Gary Keegan, actually, our, our, our sports psychologist, just really. I did a session and just hit me right between the eyes that it's not all about me, it's about the group, it's about self, and it's about what you can add, can you add to this group? And he wasn't pointed at me, it was a group session, but it just really, as if he was just chatting to me, um, and I said, right, line the sand, I said, I'm just going to roll with this. I said, I'm probably not going to play much football, but I'm going to get in and do my best. And I felt I got to a level, and then, obviously, uh, Derma came back in, and, and Jim, I presume, was just wanted to have all of his his bullets and his gun coming into an All-Ireland final. Um, and Dermot's one of my good mates, he's here. I, I played in the wing with him for 10 years, um, week in, week out, and uh, we, we, we worked well together. And um, we go good pals, play golf and drink pints and all that. But um, and it wasn't about that, it was more about the management sh not showing, or, sh or not showing, I don't know, not showing respect, or just not showing me the opportunity and me feeling as in, that that means that I'm just down another rung in the ladder that yeah. I'm not going to get my chance, which is which was the, which was the case. So, because <laughs> you, 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 you talk about respect, and you actually open you you open that kind of of worms with Jim is like um, you don't you respect me as a man, but you don't respect me as a footballer. And there's a pause, and he's like, "Well, I do," but you you basically were saying he didn't he's not showing it to you. By our yeah. words, yeah, and probably enough, looking back, like I'd say the fundamentals, and I, and I fight my corner and had some robust chats, which Jim always welcomes because he wants people to show that they care and that they're actually going to go out and, and, and get something. So Jim wouldn't, wouldn't want me to apologise for having robust conversations with him. He, he encourages it, but I definitely feel that um, looking back, they probably, the manager probably just said he's probably just like, like someone who doesn't play, like number 30 on the pitch. They, they look at and go, lovely lad, he's on the team, he's, he's there, but he's probably not going to play. And he's just maybe not good enough. And maybe that was, looking back, that's probably the way they felt, you know what I mean? But if, if, I, if I believed that, what was, the, what was the point of being there, you know what I mean? I didn't believe it. I believed that I, I, could, I could add value and I could, I could get onto the pitch and, and, and help the team. You were never going to make the decision for them. You were never going to step away and say, I've had enough here. Like... I think everyone has a right to, 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 to leave um, and retire when they want. Um, I wanted to be around. I felt I was good enough to be around. Obviously, I was coming back from a cruise ship. I, 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 I said, I'm going to get myself in such nick. 
that I'd be able to add something to this team in a year that there's going to be banana skins along the way. Um, that, and I fundamentally felt, is this team better with me in the group or without me in the group? And I weighed that it was better to have me there, um, being right or wrong. But that was my belief, and that's why I stuck around. And um, yeah, I wasn't going to walk away once I, once I kind of got that clarity in my head that session with Gary, Gary Keegan I, I, was, I was staying around. And there's lots of examples in the book about the culture of how that actually has an impact and you can help the person you're marking directly in training who comes and says well, you know, how did you do that against me or um, talking to Paul Mannion about his game and all that kind of stuff as well which, which would suggest that the culture is, is, mm. is very healthy. Um, do you feel like you were held to a different standard from other people, a higher standard because for any reason Mm. Like, one, because you'd reached such great heights. Two, maybe because you, you did commercialise your brand at a point when it was not the done thing in GAA. Mm. Did you feel that that actually was something that ever entered into someone's mind when they were making decisions about the team or whatever? Um, I would say there was potentially an unconscious bias there. Um, definitely an unconscious bias. Whether there's a conscious bias, I'm not sure. Um, but definitely that... Obviously, I'd been around a long time. Jim knew exactly how I could play the ball when I, when, I, when I played well, the way I played, when I played bad, what the signs were as the J.O., as the deck, all of the, all of the management team. So when I'm going out and trying to prove myself uh, in a match, um, in a 15 v 15, if I could get onto, the team, onto it, um, for me, to, I score four points, and that's great, and Burns moving well, and there he is. So that's seen, and in, 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 this is my view, this is seen by a management, or I would see it as well when I watch my club or watch any match when, when somebody does what they're meant to do or do, plays well. If someone else does something similar down the other end of the park, um, there's a younger guy clipping three or four points, you know what I mean? Let's get him in and see what he can do in the match. Like, when you weigh them up, like, yeah. where, where, where do you want to go and age and been around and all the, the baggage that goes with been around for a long time and been a bit older and, and not that I don't think it was ever co conscious I don't think but um, definitely it's just it's, it's human nature to, to feel that way you know what I mean coaches will view it as like a, you might be an opportunity blocker this guy could be the next Bernard Brogan who the current Bernard Brogan is actually I definitely felt that was the case along the journey of the five in a row that like I'm going to empower somebody uh, I would feel that it was I'm going to empower a young guy over Bernard who's mightn't be here next year or could get injured or, but as I said to Jim at the start, I said whether that whether that happened or not in the past where decisions were made because I was a bit older or not, I said this is the year, this is this is what this is the pinnacle. So if if I come back just if I'm good enough to play and the young guy is good, as good as me and I'm playing a little bit better, you play me. Yeah. You afford me the same opportunity you would anyone else. Yeah. Um, and that's the cultural piece that, 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 that Jim brought into the team and um, yeah, so that was, that was my, 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 my view of it, yeah. Um, you talk about the commercialism as well and, and how you've been part of a generation who have changed how GA players are marketed and, uh, and how you've taken control of that as much as you possibly can. And like every sport in the world has gone through this, literally every sport in the world has gone through this. So we're a bit behind the curve in Ireland and I think anybody calmly and coldly would rationalise that the right thing to do is to do this is to, is to continue to market the sport and to make as much money from sponsors as we possibly can. And uh, Pat Kilroy had set up a, a player's trust so that everybody got a, a mm. taste of it. Did you ever feel, though, that you suffered as a result of that? Um, I'd say the way people looked at me, def I definitely suffered. Um, I, or their perception of me um, definitely was, was, was viewed in a way due to that. I, I felt that the GA is, is the most grassroots is the most powerful organization in this country and brands and, and, and sponsors want to be aligned to it because it has such a value set that the brands and sponsors want to be aligned to and what better than an amateur sports person who gives his heart and soul to something that is for the good of his community and representing his family and parish so there's nowhere better in the world for a sponsor to live or for, for a brand to be associated with because it's it's such a pure sport and because Dublin were on a, a certain trajectory and I was a, a forward with that team, I was a natural um, choice for some of these brands. You know what I mean? And I and I I got behind it because I, I be, I'm I'm an entrepreneur. I'm commercially minded anyway. But I also felt it's the right thing to do. Was that like why shouldn't a, a, a player who was giving their, their like the rugby lads down the down the way get paid? Same a fortune, exact same thing. Yeah. And they get they, they get paid and they get in their. But this is Ireland, You can't do it. But, yeah, you're right. As in. People always begrudge that amateur is pure and amateur should be amateur, but like we're all trying to get after it. We want they want us to entertain them and, uh, <laughs> and on our final day, but then they don't want you to 
to, to reap the rewards of, of, of building a brand or, or, or going on a journey that a brand might, might, want, to, might want to partner with you. And yeah, I, I meet a lot of pushback at times from people, but I, I think that um, it, it was a, it's, it's the right thing to do and, and I encourage all GA players to get involved and, and the GPA has, has supported those views and sponsors as well. They want, they want, they want well, players. Well, it's exploded since. Like, not, not even since. Like that, you, know, I'm not, you weren't the only person doing this. There was loads of people doing it at the time. Um, but it has, it has become a science. Did it ever feed into selection at any point? Or, did, or was there ever... So 2016 is kind of the, the king of the hill appears. And I, I wonder what that experience for you was like, seeing, turning around the corner from Clonleaf onto John's Road and going, well, that's OK, that's me, you know, yeah. I'm there. I, <laughs> I was trying to, I, trying to find the bus route to keep off the, 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 the poster off the wall. Um, so that was one of my... One of the, 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 the reasons... I wanted to... The, the terms and the conditions um, was that when the bus was driving down, they didn't see me saying King of the Hill on it, which is obvious for obvious reasons. Didn't want that, but um, because of the slagging, or because you thought it was more than just slagging. Well, I, I don't like fundamentally. Like I wasn't any bigger than any player in that team. I wasn't more important than any player in that team. I genuinely felt that. Like I didn't feel like I was. I was entitled to this more than anyone. I was probably chosen for those things because I was a forward and uh, social media and different things like that. Um, but I didn't want the players to be looking at, like, and some players probably did, it's kind of begrudge, not begrudge it, but they were looking at saying, like, what, like, why are you doing this? Why are you going out on a solo run? Why are you trying to make, you're trying to be commercial? Like, and, and I didn't want it to get it between the group. And there was times when, when it came up, like anything, social media came up, people post on social media, brand stuff, sponsorship stuff. It was the same stuff that came up when you're trying to have those, those, um, those conversations around how to be, be, be better. Um, and I always, I always fought back the cases, like, why, why wouldn't, like, and, and I don't think there was, there was more than massive pushback in the team because there was, there was loads to go around as well as in yeah. there's loads of opportunities, there's six sponsors of the, of, of, of the football and there's club sponsors and county sponsors and all types of stuff. Was there ever any concern that it might be in the back of the selectors' heads, like? Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's very hard to say that it would be or wouldn't be. Um, I'd say it probably was, as in, in the back of their minds, whether, whether it was brought into the, the, the conversation around um, picking the team, I doubt it. I, as in my view, whether whether it was or wasn't, but I don't. I think that Jim and he said himself that he's no issues with commercial as long as you're producing on the pitch. Knock yourselves out. That was his line, and it was which is fair enough. Um, yeah, was it? And I was still doing some when I was um, wasn't playing as much because I was in contracts with different different brands and stuff like that. Um, but I'd say it definitely came across it. Um, I'd like to think that that wasn't the case. I'd like to think that the team was picked on the best ability of the, of the players, um, albeit there's the unconscious bias we talked about what might come into things at times, but I'd like to think that that was not a, a variable in it. What about you in terms of the pressure that it puts on you? Like, I never, yeah, I, did, I didn't think... Was it just crack? Yeah, I just I just enjoyed it. It was, it was kind of probably... I came into it early because Alan was uh, was 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 doing endorsements when I came into the team, and right. I was Alan's brother. I was naturally I oh, yeah, here's his brothers. This is a nice, two a nice for story. One. Two for one. In you go. So I kind of I, it's been always part of what I'd known. Um, yes, it ramped up and it got more more serious, and there was more like TV and different things, different mediums and stuff like that. But um, it was uh, it was it didn't tr ever throw me like I never felt like I had to play better or score more because I was had a. a an endorsement deal, or I was wearing a certain pair of boots, or yeah, because well, it's the old story about um, the double page spread on the morning of the All Ireland final. And there was it was cursed for years, and then uh, Lark Corbett did one and scored a hat trick in the All Ireland final, so it's not really connected in any way. And we wouldn't read it, we wouldn't see it. I, we I, like genuinely none of that team, I'd say, would ever read a paper in the All Ireland final. Back in the early days, I remember newspapers been around, and. Uh, um, DCU, um, where we used to um, pass early years. I remember a couple of newspapers went around in the morning because you're hanging around for so long, but that was very quickly stopped. Yeah. Uh, and you get together so early in the day and you're, 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 you're trained to kind of keep your mind pure. Um, Jim's style of play obviously evolves after the Donegal game. Uh, what's your recollection of the Donegal game, the before and after? Because with Paul Flynn sitting in, in that seat saying that um, it felt like we were saving football that year. And I could just imagine what the excitement was like because... You were all at your peak in, in one respect. That forward line, that generation of forwards, um, certainly that first 30 minutes against yeah. them, oh, it was savage. Yeah, my, my memory is that we were, we weren't flying, but I know we had had big scores from Flinner and Dermo. Um, 
and we were mowing them quite well. We were, we were finding it hard to get into our usual scoring zone, um, and I was having a tough day. Um, they just were well organised, the team, they just well drilled. Jim, in fairness, he brought that team on a journey uh, over a four or five year period that um, he really rallied rallied them to be to be to be a great team. Um, I take a lot of I have a lot of pain around that game. I, I, I take a lot of like a lot of it on my shoulders. I missed two frees in the second half that um, that I wouldn't normally miss. They were, t they were tough frees, but they were ones that I would in years gone past I would have would have scored. And I, I, I remember my my only recollection is standing under the queues, like looking into the the, the the canal end and over a free and saying I don't think I'm going to score this. And I'd never ever felt like that. And I think it was maybe it was after Ryan McHugh got a goal or whatever it was, but the, just the confidence was knocked out of me for whatever reason. I don't know why. Um, and I stepped up to it and uh, <laughs> kicked it wide or whatever whatever happened to it. Um, and just didn't feel I just didn't feel confident that day. I don't know what it was. As much as, as Flinner probably he was he had a great day and, and the different emotions, the different players, but I just never I was never comfortable that day. I don't know why. Um, and I was playing good football throughout the year. Um, but yeah, just the, maybe it's just a setup or just the lack of ball coming in as an inside forward line. Obviously, we'd had it in 2011. We'd, we'd met the team and, and, and got over the line in a, in a, in a gritty game. Yeah. Um, that was that was was dictated the way teams set up for the next five years. And eventually, I suppose Dublin kind of um, f figured out a way of breaking it down. But in 14, um, I never felt comfortable in the game. That's my that's my overwriting when you just when you say look back in it. And uh, again, it's a defeat that kind of spurs the five in a row because the five in a row doesn't happen if you don't lose that. Like you know the defensive structure, the the way that you started to control games, the basketball influence, yeah. all of that comes in. Is that it immediately after that? Is it like a is it as as stark as that? I think we had to figure out a way. We worked hard on how to break down that uh, mass defense. Um, we worked very hard on that. Um, and that we felt that was over the next couple of years that was the, that was going to be the solution here, and um, I felt like we, we we did that well, and we felt that when we come up against that team, we were going to the possession game was the, was the way to do it and way for, way for gaps and go for it. Um, so that was what was worked on heavily, and we just felt we felt if we could if we could um, we had the, the scoring prowess to beat any team, and if we could um, if we could break down that 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 mass defence that a lot of teams were, were, were taking on, um, it would be hard to stop. Yeah, because the, the insistence on um, this being like a Dublin style of play where we're, we're going to win games and shootouts and we're going to be able to do that forever, mm. um, that disappears. The, the, it didn't matter after that. It was like, we need to become a winning machine. Mm. That's the way to win games. Yeah. Um, were they hard conversations to have? Or was it just obvious? It was obvious that had to be done. Like they heard, it, it took the joy out of the game a bit. Like the, the northern style football for an inside forward like me, um, it definitely wasn't as enjoyable a game. Like I had some great games where I played well and didn't, but against the likes of Cork and Mead over the years, where you're marking your man and playing full forward, you're one on one and you're taking you, the balls been kicked, it's kick, kick, kick. Yes, some balls spray wide, some balls get lost in 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 the play, but it's just up and down, up and down. I, and I love I love that that style of football. Um, whereas now, as I said, it's into possession, it's calm control. It's not to say it's not you don't kick the ball fast, but. Um, that's yeah. As those years went on, the inside forward line had to had to adapt. Um, less crack. It. Less crack. Absolutely less crack. Yeah. Um, but you, you look at what what a Mannion can do now when when he's on song. Uh, he gets about. He works hard. He, he he's on the full back line making blocks and saves, and he's up the other end uh, getting on the end of stuff to get scores. Um, so there's there's we have to have a serious engine to do that and to be effective. Um, so the game has just evolved, like any like any sport, any game. It, it evolves through analytics and through um, through stats and understanding that you have the ball more times than the other. You win more kickouts, you have better opportunity to, to win the game, and that's what it comes down to. And somebody zigging when uh, somebody else zags. Absolutely, that's yeah. the and and you know, it definitely happened loads through it. So uh, we're talking with Bernard Brogan. The book is called The Hill. It's in all the bookshops right now. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back speaking with Bernard's brother Alan.